Welcome back to Coa Church. We are excited today to be kicking off our new series called Building Together. I'm Lauren, and I personally want to welcome everybody with us today, whether you're online at one of our neighborhood gatherings. I am really looking forward to the conversation that we are going to be starting, and for some even continuing today, all about the church and how we should be building together with our relationships towards feeling inclusive of one another. We as a church are supposed to come together to support one another, encourage one another, and we do that through having conversations where we may think differently, we may have different positions or opinions. And so I wanna encourage you today, no matter where you find yourself, I want you to lean in. I truly believe God has a word for you today. But before we jump in, will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that you made such a diverse world, that we get different upbringings, we get different perspectives, we have different opinions that we get to bring to the table. So I pray, Holy Spirit, for your wisdom to flow through the conversations today, to flow through the conversations this week, this month, as we continue to talk about what it's like to have a diverse community that is centered around loving you and loving one another. So we love you and we praise you. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Hello, Tacoa Church. As we jump into summer, we are starting a new series as a church, and we're going to take this summer to look at our culture. We're starting a series called Building Together. It's because we believe we all have a part to play in building God's house. His house is the church, and we are to build that together. And so we're going to look at the different ways that we do that. We're going to look at how you have a unique role to play in that. And we're going to look at what makes Tacoa. Tekoa, the unique things about us and our church, the, the way that God has called us specifically to impact our community here in San Jose, the things that make us as a church unique. And this is all leading up to our grand opening on September 12th when we will start meeting weekly together all in one place. And we're going to look at those unique things, the values, the things that make Tekoa a place that is different than other churches, other places. It doesn't necessarily make us better, but it makes us uniquely positioned to reach a certain people. It makes us unique in how people experience us. I heard somebody talk about culture like this. They said, it's what somebody experiences, it's what they feel. It's not a tangible thing, but it's what they feel, it's what they encounter, it's what they see, it's what they hear when they step into your group of people or your church building. So this is what we're going to look at. We're going to look at our culture. I'm excited about this because these are the things that are close to my heart. Some of our values talk about discipleship. It talks about engaging the Trinity. We, some of our values are on live, love, local, that we care about our community. These are the things as a church that we're passionate about and that we care about who we are as a church. So we're going to jump into this today by looking at one of the things that we care deeply about. Three years ago, when God gave us the yes to start moving forward with planting Tekoa Church, Allie and I started praying for Tekoa. We started praying through some of the things that we cared about, the culture we wanted as a church, the things that we really were asking God to do for us as a church. One of those things that we came consistently back to was diversity. We were praying for a diverse church. We didn't want a church that just looked like me and Allie. We wanted a church that looked like our community. We wanted a church that looked like heaven. This is why this is an important topic. Some of you might have felt deeply impacted by diversity or some of the racism conversations that have been going on this last year. Some of you might feel like I'm over these conversations. Haven't we had them enough? But it's such an important topic because it's a thing that keeps coming up for so many people. It's, it's something that we face in our world, and it's an important topic. We're talking about it today because it is close to God's heart as well. One of those reasons that this was a prayer of ours was, as I said, it's close to God's heart. It says this in Revelation, talking about what heaven is going to be like. It says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne, and before the Lamb. If heaven is going to look like this, God's bride here on earth, His church, 
should look like this now. We should be diverse. We should have people from every tribe, tongue, language, and background in our churches, just like it's going to be in heaven. Number two, it's important that the church looks like this because it is a representation of our city. We are one of the top 10 most diverse cities in the country. And if our churches don't look like our city, we are not reaching our city. And so we care that we are reaching all people. I have good news, though. While we're not perfect, as I stand and look around the room or as I sit around the circle of people as we get together, whether it be for one of our gatherings, a worship night, um, or just some people hanging out, what I see is I see people from different backgrounds, ethnicities, skin colors, ages, all coming together. I see the beginnings of what God's church is going to look like, and it's encouraging to me. It's encouraging because as God's heart is this, we are beginning to be this as a church. But I want to talk about this today so that we can continue to move forward as a church in a positive direction. And so that we can be intentional about moving in this direction. To intentional about our culture being this way. We want Tekoa to be a place where all people are welcome here and feel welcome here. And I know that it can be challenging at times. It's not a once and done conversation that we check out the box. We need to continue to have this conversation as people continue to face this struggle and our con country continues to face this struggle. I'm always grateful when I invite somebody to Tekoa or one of our gatherings and they don't look like me, they're not from my same background, and I'm able to look around the room and see, hey, the circle of people that we're sitting around is diverse. It's not just about me. It's not a church that looks like me. And this is the vision of what we want the church to be because we believe this is what, the God, what God wants the church to be. And it's important because if you've ever been in a circle of people where you feel like the outsider and nobody looks like you, it's very hard to enter in there. And sometimes, you know, we could have a church, everybody looks the same, and it feels like somebody comes in and, okay, well, is this church an Italian culture church, and somebody that's not from that culture comes in and feels like, hey, this must be what Christianity is. It's Italian culture. But it's not. The church is God's church, and church is about all of us coming together because God has invited us into his church. So as we jump in today to um, some scripture, we are looking at this because it is a, a time of year, too, where many have been facing that this year. Um, we just past the anniversary of the death of George Floyd and some of the things that happened in Minnesota. We're coming up on Juneteenth, which is a time that is very memorable for, cert for people and groups of people, and it brings up a lot of things. Some in our community have been facing a lot of hate and challenges, especially in the AAPI community. So many people have been struggling with that, with different things, um, for years and centuries, um, but this year especially has been a challenge for so many people in our community. So we're going to talk about this today. I'm going to be talking from a book called The Third Option. There was a group in our church that looked and went through this study together a year ago. I encourage you, if you want to learn more on this topic, take a look at this book. It's a great book. The pastor I've heard speak multiple times. He doesn't look like me. Um, he leads a church in San Diego, but he's a great speaker. He has some great things to say on this topic. And I love the perspective here because it doesn't apply even just to racism or ethnicity or, or any of this, but it really applies to people that are like us or not like us, or even in our country where we have our group of people and their group of people. And it can be any range of topics this can apply. And so I think it's going to be a great lesson for us today. It's a great learning opportunity for us today. So let's jump in to the Old Testament. We're going to take a look at the book of Joshua. We are looking at Joshua chapter 5. And this, we find the Israelites just coming into the land that God had promised them. And there are other people there that they're about to potentially fight. And they're in this situation, and Joshua is in this situation. It says in verse 13, When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him, his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, 
Are you for us or are you for our adversaries? We've, we're in that situation a lot of times, right? We, we just want to know, which camp are you in? Are you in our camp or, our, or their camp? Are you on our side, their side? Where are you at? Let me just quick get your position on this, and then I'll know how to proceed in this situation. It continues, though, in verse 14. It says, And he said, No, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Notice this. It's us versus them. We face this all the time in our culture. I, I, face it, I hear this all the time. We're, we're coming right now as we start into Pride Month. I hear people say this all the time. Are you on, on my side on this topic or are you against me in this topic? Um, we see this in racism. We see this with um, so many different things. Are you for or against the police? Are you for or against Black Lives Matter? Are you for or against immigration? Are you for or against guns? Are you for or against? And this is how we find ourselves and we try to evaluate. Let me just move forward. Which of these two camps are you in? And we are in a spiritual battle today and there is a fight here. And I love the response of God's messenger of what he says to Joshua. He's about to go into battle. The angel is standing there. He's asking, Joshua is asking the angel, uh, you're God's messenger, you're on our side, right? Or, or are you on their side? I need to know for how to proceed here. And the messenger, the angel responds and says, no. And I don't know if you read right past that, but that's not a response that's appropriate to Joshua's question. There was a A or B response, us or them, and the angel takes the third option. The angel says, no, I am for the Lord, and the Lord has a plan of what to do. There is a, a way that things are going to proceed here, and you might have had this idea in your head of our side or their side, but God is on his own side. He has his own plan of how he is going to proceed. And this is something that we can do and see as we are in different situations as well. Instead of trying to evaluate, is it us or them? Are you on my side or their side? Or what side are you on? Where is God in the middle of the situation? And what do we do to see what he wants us, how he wants us to proceed? There is a third option that the commander of the army proceeds. And I hear this all the time. People are angry, they're frustrated, and they're trying to move forward. And we get this us versus them mentality. We are for them, we're against them. The commander says no. And then Joshua falls on his face. He recognizes this is the situation I'm in and I had it wrong. If you know if you've ever walked into another country, you can see that there's a change that takes place, or you might not always see it, but there's the reality of the laws have changed. Sometimes we're in this, this place where we're in the world and we don't know, we think that this is the law, this is the situation that we're in, but sometimes there's a bigger authority, there's God's authority over the situation of what he wants to do. And I remember... I was in a situation like this. I've been fortunate to travel to many countries in my life. And I remember just going across the border into Canada. There's a few times where I've actually walked or driven across the border into another country. And I remember going into Canada with um, a couple friends of mine. And as we were going across the border, nothing really changed. It's really this imaginary line on the ground that we've said now, now things are different. But as soon as we step into Canada, the laws are different. The situation has changed. Now we could go back and then we're back in the U.S. authority and laws and governance. But when we step into that country, it's different. And my friend had, she had pepper spray with her. She always carried it with her. It was just a habit. She didn't even really think about it. It's just always there with her. And the border agent said, found it and said, hey, you can't bring this into our country. It's not allowed for you to walk around with this. She had the decision to make. She could, you know, just get rid of it, which she ended up doing, or she could go back to the U.S. where it was legal for her to walk around with that. But 
the, there was a new reality having stepped across the border into that situation. Joshua recognizes, hey, I'm on holy ground right now. I'm in the presence of the angel of the Lord. He recognizes, I thought this was, there was these laws governing the situation that we were in, but really I'm before God and God's laws are the ones that matter. And when we are in life, that's what matters most. What does God say about the situation? Where, what does he want to do? And I don't know about you, where you're at in life, um, what situations you're in and you're facing right now at work, at home, at school, with your family, in your neighborhood, what situations you're in. But whatever sides are present in those situations, I know that I want to be on God's side. But the thing is, God is about justice. He's also about mercy, though. And the reason he had the idea of the promised land that Joshua hadn't figured out and the Israelites for centuries had a hard time figuring out, the prophets kept coming back to tell them time and time again, the reason that God had provided a way for you forward was so that you could be a light to the people of the world. It took for Jesus and Paul and Peter for the church and God's people to finally get the message of it's not about us or them. It's about everybody, and God loves all people, and he has a message for all people. It's about God's way, and his way is about justice meeting mercy on the cross, that he provided a way for reconciliation for us. It wasn't that justice wasn't necessary, but it was that God also loved, and mercy was present in addition to justice. In church, we need to do it God's way, not our way. Politics isn't, won't fix the issue, Different um, solutions that have been present are good, and we should work towards some of these things. But God's way, His redemption of the hearts of people, is the way forward. And I want to challenge you, even as Jesus said, to pray for your enemies. I don't know what situations you're in, what situations you might face, but are you praying for your enemies? If you feel a certain way about a political topic or a certain way um, about any of the things that we're talking about today or that you might face in life, can you pray for your enemies? Can you stand in the gap and see how does God see them? It's not me versus them or our side versus their side, but God cares about everybody. Can you stop and pray for them? Can you say, God loves them. I'm going to choose to love them too and see them through God's eyes. And the thing about what Joshua did and saw in this situation and the, the, that it's a little bit different for us today because we're living a few thousand years down the road and God's path for us post-Jesus is different than Joshua's path was. What I love about the third option, the option that the angel said, that no, I'm on God's side, is there's a chance for us to look at, hey, instead of us versus them, what do we have in common? What has God done and said about all of us that is the same? When I was in grad school and I was in seminary studying to be a pastor, I was in a situation where it was a diverse group of people that I was around, but it was actually very segregated, unfortunately. And I started to have this burden of this isn't how God's church is supposed to look. And if there's going to be a change, I need to make a change. I need to act a little bit differently. And so I was intentional about trying to engage different groups of people and not just go and sit with all the white people or go sit in this group of people. And I started to make friends with a group of people and some of them were from Korea, some of them were from other Asian countries and some of them were, their families were from that ethnicity, but they were here in the United States and the America, that's where they grew up. And I started to make friends with them and it was a challenge at first because I had some different backgrounds as them. I was not the same as them. And as I began to get, make friends with them, a great opportunity came up that I was really excited about. So a bunch of these friends were from New York City. That's where they grew up and their families were still there. I had never been to New York City. Who, who doesn't want to go to New York City at least once in their life? It's something to experience. And I was really excited that I was going to get to go with them because they were going to go back home for the weekend and visit families. And I thought, great free transportation, free place to stay, some local tour guides to show me around, and I was so excited to go with them. And then a couple days before we left, one of my friends came up to me and said, 
hey, you, you can't go with us anymore. And at first I thought, okay, the trip is just off, it's canceled, and we'll go down the road in the future. And then one of them kind of took me aside and explained, no, we're all still going, but you can't go with us. And I was a little confused of, why, why can't I go with you? And it wasn't his decision, and so it was not his fault. And he kind of sheepishly had to tell me, you can't go because you're white and our families aren't comfortable with you coming with us. And at first I was hurt and I was frustrated and I was angry. How could this happen to me? And I went through that weekend and they all left and I was just frustrated and angry. And then as I started to sit there, my heart started to hurt more because I, I realized that this was just such a small taste of what so many people have experienced countless times in their life. See, I, I didn't do anything wrong, but it didn't work out the situation how I wanted to because of things totally out of my control. And it was such a feeling of injustice that I faced in that, but, it, but for most all of my life, I have had the privilege. I, things have gone my way and I've had the easy road forward, but so many other people have had other situations where they, they don't have the easy road forward. And in hindsight, I was thankful for that experience. And I had this a few experiences where I had felt racism against me. And I was thankful for it because I got a taste, a small taste. And I know everybody's situation is different. It's unique. And what I've gone through is not what you've gone through. And it's not what that person has gone through. But it, it showed me that we all can face this because the world is broken, because there's sin in the world for all of us. There's injustice for all of us. And we, as the church, need to do something about making our gatherings, our group of people, different than that, because this is God's plan, that heaven would look like a diverse group of people from every tribe, tongue, and language. And I learned something that weekend and with those groups of people, I learned how difficult it is to be with a group of people that is not like you. We can call that our out group. We have our in group of people, a group of people that's like me, but if we start to join another group of people that's not like us, it can be really hard because there's not as many similarities. There's not as much in common and it's easier to be separated. I unfortunately naturally started to drift away from those friends and like long term, those relationships didn't last. Thankfully, I did get to make other friends and I had some diverse groups of friends. I had people um, from Japan and Latin America and Europe and America and all over the world were my friends. And because of that, I actually got to experience a rich culture. I had, I met some other friends that were also from, an, their families were from an Asian background, also from New York. And I got to go with them a few months down the road and I got a great New York trip in, at the end, but from the diversity. And what I learned was how hard it can be to enter into a group of people. One of the things I like about the church and that I'm grateful for in the church is when the church is being the church, it's not a us versus them. It is about God. Because when the church comes together, it's not about what any of us look like. It's not about any of um, our family backgrounds. See, we all come from a background of not being perfect. We all come from a background where there was sin in our lives, and we all come from a background where God entered into humanity in Jesus and provided a way forward for all of us. He provided a way for restored relationship for all of us, and that is what we have in common. We are all sinners who are saved by the grace of God and we are all a part of his community and if we can all unite around that that is what we have in common sure there are differences there are things that are different about us but we are all a part of God's family we are all together in that and when we share that with the world they know too that no matter their background no matter what they've done no matter where they come from they're welcome in God's family they're welcome in his house and a part of his people one of the ways that we can do that is by realizing who God 
is and his way forward and the, the third option that he's presented of how does God see this situation? One of the ways we can do that, and I want to finish with this point today, is by renaming people, instead of putting them in a us versus them camp, by renaming them our neighbor. If we look at Matthew 22, 36 through 40, these are Jesus' words. This was my message when we started this church. The very first Sunday, this was what I preached out of. And Jesus was asked, what's the most important thing for us to do? What's the most important law? What does it mean to follow God? He said, love God with all your heart, soul, and strength and mind. This is the most important, that we love God. And you can't separate the second one from it. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. There's another passage um, with a parable called the Good Samaritan. And Jesus told this story to emphasize who is our neighbor. And in that story, he shows us that all people that we encounter in the world are our neighbor. We're to love all people. And we start to put a name on them when we start to call them our neighbor instead of that group of people over there. We can start to see through God's eyes that God loves all people. Just like he loves you, he loves them, he loves me, he loves all people. And when you start to rename them as your neighbor, we can start to see them as God sees them. So I want to encourage you. Whatever situations you're in this week, this month, as we build our church, join me in praying for a diverse church, a church that looks like the kingdom of heaven is going to look like. Join me in choosing the third option when we're confronted with the situation or people that that make us a little uncomfortable, maybe, that don't look like us, don't act like us, don't talk like us. Instead of seeing the differences that we have or the different camps, what do we have in common? What are the ways that God has made us similar? What are the ways that God has done the same thing for them and for us? What are the things that just in life practically we have in common with one another? And how can we unite around those things? Jesus is the answer. He says, if you want clarity, he said, I came to offer life and life abundantly. That was why Jesus came and he is the way forward. Right before he went to the cross, Jesus began to wash the feet of the disciples. And in John 13, Jesus is starting to wash the feet of Peter. And Peter says, well, if you're going to wash my feet, then why don't you wash all of me? And Jesus said, because you don't, all of you doesn't need to be washed clean. You are already clean. He says, you have a faith in God. You are trusting him with your life. God has already made you clean, but your feet are dirty from walking around in your sandals and in the streets and in the world. And that is what needs to be clean. Some of us haven't let God cleanse our heart, our mind, and our soul yet. There's still a rift between us and God. And God sent Jesus to be the answer to restore that relationship. And God is saying, I will wash all of you and make you clean. And that opportunity is on the table for you. Others of us have already made that decision. Maybe we've made that for a long time. But maybe your feet are a little dirty, just like Peter and the disciples' feet. And Jesus is saying, let me wash your feet. Maybe from culture, from the media, from things you've encountered. Maybe you have taken and done things that you shouldn't, and it's time to repent and let Jesus wash you of that. Maybe you haven't taken action. This is a conversation that's been going on around you and you felt like, I'm I'm over it. I I don't care about that conversation. Maybe it's time to repent and let Jesus wash your feet and say, it's okay, but going forward, I'm going to do something different to stand with my brothers and sisters that don't look like me or don't come from the same background as me. And I, and I know that they have faced some challenging things in their life. No matter where you are at in your journey, I want to encourage you to trust God, to take the way forward that Jesus is offering. I want to invite you to pray with me and offer that up and let Jesus wash your feet. Wherever you are at today, I want to encourage you to choose Jesus. Not to be in your corner, not to be in your group or put them in their group. It's not about those people. 
Jesus said this in John 13, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Join me in praying for a diverse church of people that loves one another, where all people know that they are welcome and loved by God. Take the third option of not us or them, it's about Him. It's about God, it's about Jesus and what He wants us to do in each situation. It's about what He wants us to do in life and the world. And if you need your feet washed today, if you need or want to take that opportunity to trust God or Jesus with your life, I want to invite everybody to pray with me right now. Jesus, we are not perfect. There are things from our sin, there are things from the world that have dirtied us. We want to repent from the ways that we have not moved forward, that we've not advocated for those and helped bring justice to those that need it in this world. We want to repent of the things that we've done that haven't been loving, that have brought division or hate instead of love and reconciliation. And Jesus, we want to come to you and and ask for cleansing right now. And we want to ask that you would do that and trust you with our lives, Jesus. God, right now I want to pray for our church. I want to pray that we would be a church that looks like heaven looks like, that a church that looks like our city looks like, a church of diverse people from diverse backgrounds, and that all people would know that they are welcome here at Tekoa Church, that we are a place where everybody is welcome, that everybody is cared for, because, God, we want to move forward and we ask that you would show us the way forward, that we go forward as you want us to, not as we think is best, not on our side, not asking you to just move forward on our side, be on our team, God, but we want to go forward and be on your side, God, in the way that you want us to move forward. So God, I would pray that you would move in our gatherings today and online today, and I pray as we go forward, we move to our launch, God, that we would be a church that is united under you and a church that is for all people. Amen. We want to continue the conversation with you on this topic. I know that I have so much to learn from you potentially on this topic. It's not meant to be done with a one-way monologue. I'm grateful that I got to share a biblical perspective out of this and God's heart on this this week. But over this last year particularly, we've been sitting down, Ali and I, and we've been having conversations with people, learning from them and their experience, their perspective, and hearing their story. I've been grateful to sit down to dinner, even eat some food from different people's backgrounds and their family and what they're comfortable with. I've got to sit down over a cup of coffee and just learn from what people have faced, what they've gone through and their perspective on this. Maybe you're not even sure where you're at on this, but it's something that you've been trying to process. We want to hear from you. We want to engage with you in this conversation. And as a church, this isn't a one and done kind of situation. We want to continue the conversation forward as we plant Tekoa, as we move forward. This is something we want to be continual learners on. And we want to just meet you where you're at. So let us know where you're at on this. If you want to continue the conversation, let us know. We would love to continue dialoguing with you. And I'm thankful for our neighborhood gatherings that's created a space for us to continue or even start this conversation with some people. And I'm so thankful that our groups are so diverse, that it's people with different economical backgrounds, people that grew up on the other side of the world from me and had very different experiences. And all of those perspectives and opinions help us to better understand one another. And so I'm thankful for the safe space that we've created, that we get to gather and share our experiences. And one of the ways that you can share with us is through through your Tacoa card. On the Connect page, you can fill this out and give as much information as you feel comfortable. But we would specifically like to hear this week how you've been impacted. Maybe you haven't had a conversation with anybody about what you're feeling or what you're going through. We actually read the Tacoa cards every week. And so we want to hear from you. We want to have that conversation with you. So I encourage you to go to the Connect page right now and fill out your Tacoa card. And while you're on the Connect page, we can continue our time of worship through our giving and our tithe. This is a time to give back to God because He has so 
richly blessed us. And I know for our church, we are very thankful for the finances that have given us the ability to create these neighborhood gatherings, to create this diverse space where we get to come together and we get to worship God. And so we're going to go into this time of our tithe and giving, and I encourage you to lean into what it is God is prompting you. It's different for everybody, but when we respond to that call, when we listen to what God is prompting us to, it helps us to go even deeper in relationship with him and grow as a church. So I encourage you now to go to the Connect page to fill out your Tokoa card and continue your time of worship through giving. I'm so grateful for so many of you that are helping make the vision of Tokoa reality, a vision of a church that is diverse and is reaching the people of our city. We are doing that and you are a part of it. I want to invite you back next week. We're going to continue talking about our culture and what it looks like to build this church together. We're going to be looking at what it means to go all in. If you've ever felt like you have a hard time moving forward or being really committed because you have some anchors weighing you down, you have a hard time letting go of certain things in your life, we're going to look at how you can be fully committed all in on certain things of your life and how that can be an accelerator for growth in your life and help you make a difference and an impact in this world. So we want to invite you back next week for that. We hope you have a great week.